My apologies for not speaking German, but uh, by the time I leave here, I may be speaking German. <laughs> uh, I have no idea how long this is going to uh, take. This isn't really about me, it's about uh, an attempt to silence any movement to oppose the trade in shark fins. The trade in shark fins is actually the uh, third largest illegal trade after guns and drugs. And last year Costa Rica shipped off 30 tons of shark fins to China. 30 tons. That's hundreds of thousands of sharks. And that brings in a lot of money. And that money buys a lot of influence. And when I met with the foreign minister for Costa Rica, it was rather funny because he said, don't worry, in Costa Rica, we, we have no corruption. It's not a corrupt country. <laughs> and then he said, you'll be perfectly safe in our jails because we have two ex-presidents and they're safe and they're in prison. <laughs> so I said, well, let's go back to where you said there's no corruption. What are the two ex-presidents doing in prison? <laughs> It's a very corrupt country. I have volunteered to go to Costa Rica if they lift the extradition. I said, all you have to do is set a trial date. We'll bring our witnesses, we'll bring our film, and we'll go to the trial. They don't want to do that. Why? They want me brought in handcuffs to be put in a prison for up to a year until they set that trial date. And for what? 10 years ago, we were working with the rangers at Cocos Island, off uh, 300 miles off of Co Costa Rica. And the year before, in 2001, we had intercepted an Ecuadorian longliner that was catching hundreds of sharks. We seized the vessel, we turned it over to the rangers, and that became the first vessel to ever be confiscated by the Costa Rican courts for illegal fishing. We set a precedent. In response to that, the rangers wanted us to work with them. So we were providing them with generators and boats, and we were their main source of supply for equipment. So the next year we were to come back and sign an agreement with the uh, Costa Rican government. And on our way down in April of 2002, we encountered a Costa Rican longliner in the waters of Guatemala that was killing sharks and finning them, and you saw that on the film. We filmed this, we told them to stop, they refused. So we got in touch with the Guatemalan government and the Guatemalan government gave us permission to stop them, which we did. Didn't think anything of it, we carried on to Costa Rica. And the next day we were boarded by the police and the prosecutors and I was charged with endangering the lives of the fishermen. Nobody was injured, no property was damaged. So we went into court and we showed them our film and our witnesses and they dropped the charges. So we were free to go. <laughs> Two days later, we were boarded again a second time because they had appointed a new prosecutor and a new judge and charged me all over again. So we went into court, we showed them our film, we gave them our statements and witnesses and they dropped the charges. And I was given permission to leave Costa Rica. That was 10 years ago. Never heard a thing about it since then until I arrived in Frankfurt on May 13th to find that I was arrested because Costa Rica had an extradition warrant on me and it had been dismissed by Interpol as being politically motivated by every other country in Europe. So if I had landed in France or Spain or Italy or England, I would not have been arrested. Germany, which does not have an extradition treaty with Costa Rica decided to act on it, and no explanation has been given as to why they are doing that. The Justice Minister will say nothing. Shame on Germany. And, but I, I should point out the people in Germany have been incredible, um, but we haven't had very much support from the politicians. Of course, that's probably pretty much the case everywhere in the world. Politicians don't do much anyway. Uh, when you want something done, you've got to get people to do it, and. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we get punished for doing that. But what has happened over the last 10 years that has gotten them so angry? We have a partnership in the Galapagos Islands with the Rangers and the Ecuadorian police. 
And over the last 10 years, we have seized numerous Costa Rican vessels, and we have confiscated over 200,000 shark fins uh, from these vessels. We have cost them millions of dollars. That's what's behind all of this, the fact that we are costing these people millions of dollars. And they buy influence, and those politicians want me back in Costa Rica. In 2002, the rangers at Cocos Island said that they had put a $25,000 hit on me, that is the shark binners, and that anybody can get $25,000 if they kill me. I don't know what it is now, but what better place to collect on that than in a Costa Rican jail? That's where they want me. They don't want a trial. They want an execution. And that's what this is all about. Over the last 10 years in the Galapagos, what we've done is we set up an AIS system, cost us a million euros to do it, that detects every single vessel that comes into the national park. We've supplied a patrol boat, a canine unit, dogs that ship, sift, sniff out the shark fins, and radios for the police, and we've become a very important part of protecting the Galapagos. We want to do, we've been wanting to do this with Cocos Island also. What we've seen is an incredible diminishment. The shark population at Cocos Island is probably about 10% of what it was 20 years ago. And all over the world you're finding that this is the case. Shark, fish populations, shark populations are collapsing. Every year we are killing 75 to 100 million sharks. And everybody says, oh, well, you know, sharks are dangerous creatures, they're monsters. The average number of people killed by sharks every year is five. The average number of people killed by ostriches every year is a hundred. The ostrich is far more dangerous than the shark. And the number of people who are killed by lightning on golf courses every year is far greater. The number of people killed by coconuts dropping on their heads in Hawaii is far greater. Sometimes people get killed when they go into places where things happen. But the shark is not that monster that everybody thinks it is. In fact, what the shark is, is the architect of our oceans. 450 million years of evolution has been molded by the shark. Every fish you see in the sea, its behavior, its color, its camouflage, is because of the shark. It is the apex predator and the ultimate architect of life in the sea. And if we remove it, we cause irreparable damage to our oceans. What Sea Shepherd is about is not just protecting whales and sharks and seals. It's about protecting the biodiversity of our oceans, the life support system of planet Earth. If the oceans die, we die. It's as simple as that. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And right now, we are in the process of destroying life in our oceans, from plankton to the great whales. And you're not going to stop this by taking pictures and hanging banners and sending letters. You're only going to stop it by direct intervention. So I set the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society up 35 years ago, not to protest. I don't believe in protesting. To me, protesting is submissive. You know, please, please, please don't kill the whales. And they do it anyway. Nobody has killed a whale since we, when we show up because we tell them we're not here to protest, we're here to stop you. With whaling, for instance, in the Southern Ocean last year, the Japanese got 26% of their quota. The year before that, 17% of their quota. We've cost them hundreds of millions of dollars over the last eight years. That's why they're so angry. So last October, the Japanese government gave $30 million from the Tsunami Relief Fund to the whalers to use against Sea Shepherd. And what are they doing with that money? PR firms, lawyers, they, they, they tried an injunction on us in the United States, they failed, they lost the case. And they've been looking everywhere in the world to find ways to do it. The Prime Minister of, of Japan met with the President of Costa Rica in December. And that's the connection right there. Japan is really behind this Japanese pressure. Now, good news. Last yesterday, uh, our court case in England, we were being sued by the Maltese company Fish and Fish because in 2010 we released 800 bluefin tuna from their nets off of Libya, and they sued us. Yesterday we won. They have to pay our legal costs, so they have to give us 200,000 pounds. 
And the amazing thing, the amazing thing is, is for 35 years we've been doing this, we've never been sued successfully by anybody. We've won every case. We have never been convicted of a crime. We have never injured anybody, and we've never had anybody seriously injured. We're proud of that record, and we intend to keep it. If, go, if we go to Costa Rica and I go on trial, we will win this case because everything is on film. Everywhere we go, we bring cameras. The camera is the most powerful weapon that's ever been invented, and we don't do anything without cameras that are on there. That's the reason we started our own television show. If you want people to pay attention, get your own television show. <laughs> if it isn't on television, it's not real. <laughs> And how that happened is that I went to all the TV, TV networks and I said, you know, the biggest show on Discovery right now is a bunch of men going into a very rough area of the ocean and catching crabs. I can give you men and women from around the world going to a far more remote place, a far rougher seas to save whales, and we'll throw in icebergs and penguins. It's got to be better than catching crabs. And so that show is now the number one show on, on Animal Planet, and uh, that has been a very, very uh, good base of support for Sea Shepherd. Now the reason Sea Shepherd has been successful over the 35 years is because of one very important thing. Our crews are volunteers from all over the world. That's what makes Sea Shepherd what it is. The imagination, the courage, and the passion of those volunteers. And we've had over 4,000 people participate on our ships. And they come from everywhere. Because I could not pay people to do what these people do for nothing. The risks that they take and the work and the effort they put into it, you couldn't hire anybody to do this. And so that's what makes us unique, is the men and women from around the world who crew on our ships, and the men and women from around the world who support us on shore. This is what makes us what we are, an all-volunteer organization. Because I feel that to address impossible problems, we need impossible solutions. And I believe the impossible can become possible through the application of imagination, courage, and passion. An example I always show about that is 1972. The very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa in 1972 was unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible. Yet it happened. So I think we can save our oceans as impossible as it might seem. And that's going to come from the imagination, passion, and courage of hundreds of thousands of people around the world getting involved because people make a difference. People solve problems. Governments do not. When my daughter was uh, 12 years old, she came home from school with a note and uh, the teacher was upset with her because her, the question was, what is the definition of government? And my daughter said, oh, it's a bunch of men who get together to kill animals and other people. <laughs> And they were very, very upset about that. And I said, well, it's a pretty accurate definition as far as I can see. Because when you look back throughout history, every single, so single social problem has not been solved by government. Slavery was ended by Douglas and Wilberforce. Women got the vote because of the suffragettes who were in the streets. You know, it was the Gandhis and the Mandalas and the, it, it, these are the, the, the people who made a difference, not presidents and prime ministers. And the reason that we have this pirate symbol as our, our flag, well, first of all, people were calling us pirates, and we said, okay, if you want to be, call us pirates, we'll be pirates. Uh, they call us eco-terrorists, but that's wrong. I don't work for BP. <laughs> but if you go back to the 17th century, if you go back to the 17th century, when piracy was out of control in the Caribbean, it wasn't the British or the Spanish navies that shut down the pirates. The reason for that? People were making money. Merchants in London were making money. The navy was taking bribes. The politicians were taking bribes. Not much different than the way things are today. Piracy was shut down by Henry Morgan, a pirate. You want to stop pirates, you get pirates to do it. Because the biggest pirates in the world are the presidents and the prime ministers and the congressmen and everybody, the politicians, or as Mark Twain once referred to the United States Congress as the Parliament of Whores. <laughs> so this is who we're fighting, people who are guarding vested interests. Our oceans are in trouble. Our oceans are dying, and nobody is doing 
anything about it on a government level. We have all the laws, we have all the regulations, we have the treaties, but there's no economic or political willpower to uphold it. We just had this pathetic meeting in Rio de Janeiro, 20 years after the last pathetic meeting in Rio de Janeiro, where they all got together and stayed in five-star hotels and ate gourmet meals and signed a letter about how we promise we're going to make a difference. They never make a difference. That's where they coined the word sustainable back in 1992. You know what sustainable means? Business as usual under another name. We'll just call everything sustainable and we can sell it. That's all it's about. There is no sustainable fishery in the world today. Not one. The oceans are dying. And they're dying because of this thing what we call, I call it the economics of extinction. There's money to be made by driving species extinct. And the bluefin tuna is a good example. One fish, one fish is worth 50,000 euros. One fish. With that kind of price on its head, its chances of survival are not very good. One fish. But as the numbers in the ocean go down, the price for the ones in the warehouses go up. And Mitsubishi and other companies are putting them into warehouses. They got a 10 year supply. And if there's no more bluefin tuna in our oceans, and the only bluefin tuna left are in Mitsubishi's warehouses in Japan, a half a, half a million euro fish is what we're talking about, and billions of profits for Mitsubishi. They want the fish to go extinct because diminishment translates into higher prices. And this is happening all over the world. They don't care about the future. They just care about short-term investment for short-term gain. And now what they're doing is robbing all future generations. So what's the world gonna look like in 100 years? You know what I find really amazing is when politicians say, oh, that's okay, uh, the United Nations said that our fisheries will not collapse until 2048. So that's uh, fine if you were just born last year and by the time you're 50 years old, there's no more fishing industry, but that's okay, that's your problem. It's not our problem. We're gonna eat our monkfish and our salmon and our cod and our bluefin tuna and fuck you. You know, that's pretty much what we're saying to future generations. And that's where we've got to, we've got to intervene because we represent the majority. All of those people who have yet to be born from here on in, we're representing them. And they need us to take a stand. So I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen if they send me back to Costa Rica, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what will be, will be. But we certainly intend to use this whole case as a way to focus on the big problem, the killing of our sharks and the destruction of our oceans. And we're gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can to uh, put the attention on that particular thing. Uh, if I go to Costa Rica, I go to Costa Rica. But I'll tell you one thing, if I do go to Costa Rica, and I do get killed in Costa Rica, the government of Germany will be responsible. And they, they should be aware of that. But then again, they might not care, which wouldn't be that unusual. But um, anyway, Sea Shepherd uh, will continue without me. Um, our campaigns in the South Pacific are going ahead right now. Our vessels left last week. And to protect sharks in Fiji and Tonga and places like that, that's where they're going right now. And in December, our vessels will head to the Southern Ocean, four ships to go after the Japanese whaling fleet and our campaign this year is called Operation Zero Tolerance because our objective is not a single whale to be killed. I think we're finally in a position where we have the equipment and the people and the means and the experience to shut them down 100%. So that's our, that's our goal. And of course we have our Cove Guardian program, so we send people from September 1st to March 1st to Taiji, Japan, to be there to 
you know, to oppose the killing of the, the dolphins. We'll be opposing and continuing to go after the bluefin tuna fishermen in the, in the Mediterranean, uh, protecting seals in Namibia, trying to stop the uh, destruction of the plankton in the Southern Ocean also. There's so many things that we got involved with. But we're just one small organization. And what's gonna make a difference is hundreds of thousands of small organizations. We can't depend upon the big organizations to do anything. They're not gonna do anything. You know, there's too much, too much money involved. Once you get big, you become useless. So we need small organizations and uh, addressing different things. 100,000 organizations addressing 100,000 different things. Protecting the, 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 the orangutans in, in Indonesia, protecting the, the, you know, the elephants, protecting coral reefs. This is what I try to get people to address. Look at what you're passionate about and get involved. Because I can't think of anything more noble than dedicating yourself to protecting a species or an ecosystem. Because of Diane Fossey, mountain gorillas continue to survive in Rwanda. Because of Jane Goodall, people are aware of the problems with the chimpanzees. Because of Barute Galdikas, orangutans are being protected in Indonesia. Because of David Wingate, the Bermuda storm petrel, a little bird in Bermuda is not extinct. That one man had prevented that bird from becoming extinct. That's where we make a difference, on that level. And this is what we try to encourage with our crew, is this understanding that each and every one of us, you and I, have the power to make that difference. And we don't all have to do it by getting on a ship and chasing a whaling boat. All we have to do is what we do best. If you're a writer, if you're a builder, if you're a lawyer, if you're a teacher, you do it for the future, you do it for the planet. And that diversity makes a movement. The strength of an ecosystem in diversity, the strength of a movement is in diversity. And that's the kind of diversity that we're, we're trying to encourage. I'll just finish off with a story uh, about why I'm so dedicated to protecting whales. And it goes back to 1975, and um, Robert Hunter and I organized the first Greenpeace campaign to protect whales. It was against the Soviet whaling fleet in the Pacific. And we had come up with this idea. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and we felt that all we had to do was put ourselves between the harpoon and the whales, and the Russians wouldn't dare kill a whale because they might risk killing us. Like I said, we're, it sounded good when we read Gandhi. But Bob and I found ourselves in a small little rubber boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel that was traveling at about 20 knots and chasing eight magnificent sperm whales that were running away from it, trying to get away. So we found ourselves in that position and I maneuvered the boat to block the harpoon. And every time the harpooner tried to get a shot, I would block it with the harpoon. And this worked for about 25 minutes. And then the captain came out and came up the catwalk and screamed into the ear of the harpooner. And then he looked at us and he smiled and he went like this. And that's when I realized Gandhi's not gonna work today. <laughs> and a few moments later, there was this incredible explosion and the harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of one of the whales in front of us and exploded and she screamed. She screamed, it was like a woman in pain. It was hard to really describe. We couldn't, we were in total shock at that. She screamed and rolled on her side, a fountain of blood, blood everywhere, and suddenly the largest whale in the pods rose up out of the water, smacked the water with his tail and disappeared. And he swam straight underneath of us. And he threw himself out of the water straight at the harpooner on the Soviet vessel to protect his pod. But they were waiting for him. They put in another harpoon, an unattached harpoon, and they pulled the trigger at point blank range, hit him in the head, and he screamed and fell back into the water with two dying whales around us, blood everywhere. And as he was rolling around in agony on the surface, I saw his eye, and he looked at me, and he dove. And now I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast, and he came up and out of the water at an angle. So the next movement was to fall down on us and crush us. And as his head rose up out of the water, and I saw that eye come out of the water, an eye that was the size of my fist, what I saw there, that is what changed my life forever, because I saw understanding. That whale understood what we were trying to do. And I'll never forget my own reflection in the eye of that whale. That's how close it was. And as he came up, he pulled himself back, and his body began to slide back into the sea, and I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface, and he died 
could have killed us, and he chose not to do so. And he had every right to do so, but he chose not to do so. I owe my life to that whale. But I saw something else in that eye. Pity, and not for himself, for us. How could we do something so merciless? How could we take life without so any thought? And for what? The Russians weren't eating the whales. They were making, they were using the oil for high heat resistant machinery. And one of the most valuable things that they were using spermaceti oil for was the construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. I said, here we are, destroying this incredibly beautiful, intelligent, socially complex, beautiful creature for the purpose making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings, and that's when it hit me. We are insane, ecologically insane to support that. And so, from that moment on, I said to myself, we do what we do for them, not for people for them. Our clients are whales. Our clients are sharks and seals and sea turtles. That's who we represent. So when people say, oh, I disagree with your tactics. So find me a whale that disagrees with our tactics. You know, we don't represent people. We represent whales, but we do it responsibly. We've never injured anybody. We've never killed anybody. And in 1985, I had a Tibetan Buddhist monk come to my ship in Seattle, and he gave me this little statue. And he said, I've been asked to give this to you, and could you put it up on your top mast, and it's for protection and everything. And I said, sure, OK, but uh, what's it about? He says, I've just been asked to give it, give it to you. And so I guess when a Tibetan Buddhist monk comes along, gives you a little statue, and tells you to put it up on the mast, why not? So we put it up there. <laughs> I didn't think anything of it until 1989, four years later, I had the great opportunity to meet with and speak with the Dalai Lama. And I brought a picture of this, and I showed it to the Dalai Lama. I said, what is this? And he looked at me, he says, I sent that to you. <laughs> and I said, what is it? He says, it's called Hayagriva. And I said, well, what's that mean? He says, it's the symbol for the compassionate aspect of Buddha's wrath. And so I said, what's that mean? And he says, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometimes uh, when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> so he understood what we were doing, what I call aggressive nonviolence. We don't hurt people, but we destroy their equipment. And to me, that's an act of nonviolence. You destroy a harpoon, you destroy a rifle, you destroy a whaling ship, you're saving lives. And the act of saving lives is nonviolent. And as Martin Luther King once said, you cannot commit an act of violence against a non-living thing. But if you commit an act of so-called destruction against a physical object meant to kill somebody, that is an act of nonviolence. And so Sea Shepherd is a very nonviolent organization if you accept that. But in a society where property is more important than life, people accuse us of being violent. And that's why we get called all sorts of names. But, like I said, we haven't been convicted of a single crime. And two years ago, I was invited actually to speak to the FBI in Quantico in the United States. Uh, they actually paid me to give them a lecture at the FBI Academy. And the question period, one of the FBI agents said, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty damn fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, yeah, but who cares how fine it is as long as you don't cross the line? <laughs> so they couldn't argue with that. But then one of them said, well, yes, but you're training people to, to be eco-terrorists. And people who join your crew can go on and become eco-terrorists. I said, well, I can't be responsible for what people do when they're not under my command and they're not with Sea Shepherd. And he said, yeah, well, you train them. You're responsible. I said, okay, I got three names for you. Timothy McVeigh, Lee Harvey Oswell, and Osama Bin Laden. You train them, you're responsible. So don't give me that question. It's a double, it's a double standard that we have to deal with all the time. The fact is the most non-violent movement that has ever existed on the planet has been the environmental conservation movement. 360 environmentalists have been murdered and yet that's not most people aren't even aware of it but not one single person that we have opposed has been killed not one so they're always pointing their finger 
but it's all just public relations. The most violent people on this planet are the people who are destroying the planet, not the people who are saving the planet. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for your support. And uh, that's very, it's, 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 we have the support of divers around the world. So all of you who are divers are very appreciative of that. Divers and surfers especially, because these are people who really understand our, our oceans. And uh, I think that anybody who's actually been down and swum amongst sharks and amongst fish will understand that these are creatures with intelligence. These are creatures that feel, these are creatures that are aware and that they're self-aware. Yeah. So, that's true. That's why our ship, uh, that's why our ships are vegan vessels. But the reason, one, one of the reasons for that is because 40% of all of the fish taken out of the ocean is fed to pigs and chickens and cats. 40%. Now, that means that the world's pigs are eating more fish than all the world's sharks put together. Domestic house cats are eating more fish than all the world's uh, seals put together. And chickens in Denmark alone are eating more fish than all the world's albatross and puffins put together. So if people don't really put that together or understand that the fish being pulled out of the ocean is being, 40% of it is being fed to animals, which in turn are fed to people. And it takes 70 fish out of the ocean to raise one salmon on a salmon farm. So we're literally eating the oceans alive. Go vegan! Thank you. Any, any, uh, So I guess we could, and anybody have any questions? <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul. Für alle, die mit dem Englischen ein bisschen Probleme haben, haben wir die Anne da, die übersetzen wird. Das heißt, wenn jemand eine Frage hat, die ihm auf der Seele brennt, aber nicht weiß, wer sie formulieren soll, kann er sie auch gerne auf Deutsch stellen und Anne wird diese dann übersetzen. Gibt es denn Fragen? Ja. I wasn't actually coming to Germany, I was on my way to France, but I happened to be in Denver, and I made the mistake of getting on Lufthansa, which put me in Frankfurt. So if I had a flu to Paris, I'd be okay. <laughs> I think the, the best thing to do is just to convey uh, your uh, message to the justice minister of uh, Germany. Yeah, just keep bugging her, you know, she's got to get, apparently she's gotten 140,000 letters so far, and uh, we've also been supported by the Brazilian Senate, put out a video uh, criticizing Germany and Costa Rica, the uh, French Senate, uh, the five nations of the Iroquois, the, uh, the United States did, the Native Indians, um, and also the former environment minister of Australia, and the former environment minister of Costa Rica, who is supporting us. And uh, so we, we, have, we do have a, a quite a bit of uh, support there. And the former environment minister of British Columbia and Canada. So that's three environmental environment ministers. Um, and of course, we've gotten a lot of celebrity support from Pamela Anderson and uh, Tommy Lee and uh, the Pierce Brosnan and Martin Sheen and Michelle Rodriguez have been all that are very good in putting out uh, videos and criticizing everybody. Actually, I'm trying to get Sean uh, Connery and, and Pierce Brosnan here because I figure we got to call in James Bond, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but uh, see if they can do it. But uh, but there's something here. There's some. There's an agenda here that nobody's telling us about. Because you do not go to all of this trial and effort and expense to arrest somebody ten years later for something where nothing was damaged and nobody was hurt. Just on the complaint of a couple of fishermen who were already convicted of being poachers, and everything is on camera. It doesn't make any logical sense. So there's something else that is being hidden here. And I personally think it's Japan leaning on Germany and Costa Rica. The Japanese hate us with a passion because last September the Prime Minister of Japan said, we will not surrender to Sea Shepherd. They're treating us like we're a nation that they're at war with. 
which is bizarre, really, and very humiliating for the Japanese, I would think. But it shows uh, that you made a good job, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the question is now, what's, what's your situation now? You have to stay in Germany? You have to say each day hello to the police station? Or what is now the situation? <laughs> yes, I'm not allowed to leave Germ Germany. I can go anywhere in Germany as long as I report once a day to the police station in Frankfurt. So they collect my autograph once a day. I go in and sign. <laughs> They're very friendly, actually. They're very supportive and very apologetic. In fact, the judge apologized for it, uh, the prison apologized, the police apologized. Every, but once you get up to whoever these people are in power, I don't know what their interest is, but, uh, and uh, so it's, it's difficult. Yes? Um, he is asking that the politics at the moment it doesn't work this way, but how would politics have to be to actually make an impact? The Minister of Justice has the power to release me right now because Costa Rica and Germany have no extradition treaty and Interpol dismissed the warrant, so she has the power to do it. So stand up. Okay. So actually she's acting against the law in that way, right? Well, our argument is that the warrant was illegal and we put in two motions in the Costa Rican court on this because how do you put out an extradition warrant without the person ever being notified that they were wanted in court? We were never, I was never given the opportunity to come to court. So that makes the warrant illegal, but the judges in Costa Rica have simply refused to acknowledge yes or no. They won't say anything. They're just not acknowledging our motions. <laughs> <laughs> She's asking that normally on a ship you get seasick, but are you getting land sick at the moment? How do you spend your time? Uh, no, actually I'm trying to make uh, the most of my time here, so I'm working on my book Whale Wars about our Antarctic campaigns and uh, a few other projects. And my Rosetta Stone German program arrives, I think, tomorrow, so I'll begin to learn German, so hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> to the Southern Ocean with four ships this year. Uh, and the fourth ship is to be called the Sam Simon because he donated the money for it. Uh, Sam Simon, by the way, is the co-producer of The Simpsons. So we might have a big Bart Simpson on the boat, I don't know. <laughs> And we'll also be bringing, uh, the most important part of that, we'll be bringing about 120 volunteers uh, down to the Southern Ocean on that. Which, by the way, if anybody ever has the opportunity, it's the most beautiful place on Earth, the Southern Ocean. There's nothing like it. It's like going to another planet. And the great thing about it is you're sitting there and you know that there's not another human being for a thousand miles. <laughs> Um, he's asking where you are staying at the moment. Bornheim. <laughs> It's a nice 
place. No place. So I use Oh. <laughs> are you staying with volunteers or do you have your own place? <laughs> uh, I don't know if my lawyer's here, but it's my lawyer's girlfriend's place. <laughs> so she, she's letting us use it. Yes. Um, have you ever been to the only um, vegan cafe in Frankfurt? There's a vegan cafe in Frankfurt. Only one, unfortunately. <laughs> no, I, 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 I haven't heard of it, no. no. We would like to see you there. Okay. Where is it? Just, well, tell, tell us later where it is. <laughs> Vornheim. Vornheim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, if you got any more questions. Okay. Any more? You, you have one? Um, how can I get in um, part of you and Helping you with uh, fighting against the uh, uh, well, you can answer that. Um, he wants to know how he can get on you the ship. Can. Oh, on the ship, right? Well, you yeah. can certainly support it here. Right? Uh, you get a crew application, put it in, and then. Uh, uh, Peter Hammerstead will interview you to see if you're <laughs> we, we, we always turn everybody over to the hammer to decide whether, you know, you got, but uh, no, the chances of getting on at some time, maybe not the next campaign, but at some time are very good because we try to make room for as many people as possible on that. And as long as you're 18, uh, there's no age restriction. I think our oldest crew member was 86. <laughs> Uh, your situation uh, was surprising you coming here to the airport, and over the, over the time now, have it, uh, have it shown up also good sides of this situation now that you get support, or have you also positive? Oh yeah. Well, first of all, I, you know, I had no idea I was going to be arrested. But the second part is that the, the positive side is we can focus attention on the issue. And uh, Costa Rica is not very happy because now everybody's talking about shark finning in Costa Rica. And this country, which is supposed to have a reputation of being so green and so democratic, isn't coming off very green or very democratic. Uh, people are starting to realize what we've known for uh, years about Costa Rica, that the tour tourist brochures are basically a lie. You know, there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of environmental uh, uh, degradation going on, it, both in the forests of Costa Rica and in the oceans off of Costa Rica. Uh, I have seen that steady diminishment of uh, biodiversity off Costa Rica, and it is, it's one of the worst. In fact, I would say Costa Rica is the worst Latin American country for killing sharks. Worse than Colombia, worse than Ecuador, worse than Panama. It is the number one, uh, along with Nicaragua, because Nicaragua is supplying shark fins to Costa Rica. So Nicaragua and Costa Rica are the two bad places. Thank you. Ja, ich möchte mich auch noch mal ganz recht herzlich bedanken bei dir, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the panel. Danke schön. Ja, bevor wir.